Okay. I um, want to welcome you to the Bexley Public Library. Uh, on behalf of the library and the Board of Trustees, um, we are incredibly fortunate to have the support of Doug Kreidler and Jack Marchbanks uh, to present this most auspicious event, um, which is the centennial celebration of James Weldon Johnson's Book of American Negro Poetry. We're also extremely fortunate to have poets who are going to um, regale us in real time here this afternoon. Um, just by way of introduction, of course, Doug runs the Columbus Foundation. He's devoted his life to public service and enriching our community through fundraising, uh, through awareness, uh, through community involvement. Dr. Jack Marchbanks really, to most of you, probably needs no introduction uh, as well. Uh, I don't know if Renaissance man is the right term to use, but, but yeah, it probably works and fits. Um, but, but Jack likewise um, has made sure uh, over the course of his career uh, that the public is educated, involved, uh, and informed, which is what we expect today's program to be. Jack, Doug, thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, special thanks to all those who are watching online and to those who are here. I was speaking to Josh and Zach and Paige uh, back during Black History Month and I told them, oh, you know, by the way, that this upcoming June marks the centenary of James Weldon's Johnson publication of the uh, Book of American Negro Poetry, an anthology that included the 30, 31 famous poets at that time, including, uh, of course, Paul Lawrence Dunbar here, uh, here in Ohio, who is very beloved out of the Dayton area. So the idea came about that we could not let the centenary, the centennial of the publication of this landmark work go forward without us recognizing it. <laughs> Sam referred to me as a Renaissance man. No, I'm not. James Weldon Johnson was a Renaissance man. Uh, born, uh, actually, June 17th, uh, just later on this week, will mark his 151st birthday anniversary. He was born June 17th, 1871 in Jacksonville. Florida, this man, by the time he was 23, had already graduated from Atlanta University, met Paul Lawrence Dunbar, with whom he became lifelong friends, and at the age of 23 became a high school principal in Stanton, uh, Stanton, high, Stanton School in Florida. Uh, he went on, after becoming a principal, to study law, became a lawyer. Uh, his brother, John Rosamond Johnson, J. Rosamond Johnson, happened to be a songwriter. And on the uh, anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, he chose, they had written a song that they thought spoke to the time that had passed since Lincoln's assassination and looking into the future, 1900. Imagine how we all felt in 2000, the beginning of a new millennium. But in 1900, they were looking forward to the new year, new, new century. And they wrote, lift every voice and sing. And it was actually a group of uh, elementary school students who first performed that song. And it's become you know, the African American National Anthem and a song emblematic of human rights all around the world. James Weldon Johnson uh, also became quite the literary, activ literary activist and uh, actual activist serving as field, field secretary for the NAACP. He was actually brought in uh, to heal the rift between the Booker T. Washington faction and the W.E.B. Du Bois faction uh, and the NAACP, and he served as their field secretary all the way until 1930. So in all of that, he also was a leading light of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, he felt that if African Americans could demonstrate to the world you know, their humanity, their artistry through poetry, it would help combat ugly, persistent racism. And from his work uh, through Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, Rita Dove, Nikki Giovanni, all the way to Amanda Gorman. We owe a debt to James Weldon Johnson. And uh, I'm very thankful 
and humble to help present this recognition of this great American. And I thank Doug Kreitler, who answered the call when I asked him to help me support this event. With that, we have a small video clip, short one, that gives you uh, perhaps a better summation of uh, James Weldon's life than I gave you. And then we'll hear uh, Mr. Johnson's own voice uh, for, uh, reciting one of his most famous poems, The Creation from God's Trombones. So thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for joining us online. James Weldon Johnson Biography 1871 to 1938 James Weldon Johnson was an early civil rights activist, a leader of the NAACP, and a leading figure in the creation and development of the Harlem Renaissance. Who was James Weldon Johnson? James Weldon Johnson was a civil rights activist, writer, composer, politician, educator and lawyer, as well as one of the leading figures in the creation and development of the Harlem Renaissance. After graduating from Atlanta University, Johnson worked as a principal in a grammar school, founded a newspaper, The Daily American, and became the first African American to pass the Florida Bar. His published works include The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, 1912, and God's Trombones, 1927. Early Life and Career James Weldon Johnson was born in Jacksonville, Florida, on June 17, 1871, the son of a freeborn Virginian father and a Bahamian mother, and was raised without a sense of limitations amid a society focused on segregating African Americans. After graduating from Atlanta University, Johnson was hired as a principal in a grammar school. While serving in this position, in 1895, he founded the Daily American newspaper. In 1897, Johnson became the first African American to pass the bar exam in Florida. Not long after, in 1900, James and his brother, John, wrote the song Lift Every Voice and Sing, which would later become the official anthem of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The Johnson brothers would go on to write more than 200 songs for the Broadway musical stage. Johnson then moved to New York and studied literature at Columbia University, where he met other African American artists. NAACP career and published works. In 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt appointed James Weldon Johnson to diplomatic positions in Venezuela and Nicaragua. Upon his return in 1914, Johnson became involved with the NAACP, and by 1920, was serving as chief executive of the organization. Also during this period, he became known as one of the leading figures in the creation and development of the African-American artistic community known as the Harlem Renaissance. Johnson published hundreds of stories and poems during his lifetime. He also produced works such as God's Trombones, 1927, a collection that celebrates the African-American experience in the rural South and elsewhere, and the novel The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, 1912, making him the first black American author to treat Harlem and Atlanta as subjects in fiction. Based, in part, on Johnson's own life, the autobiography of an ex-colored man was published anonymously in 1912, but did not attract attention until Johnson reissued it under his own name in 1927. Later Years and Legacy After retiring from the NAACP in 1930, Johnson devoted the rest of his life to writing. In 1934, he became the first African-American professor at New York University. Johnson died in a car accident in Wiscasset, Maine, on June 26, 1938, at the age of 67. More than 2,000 people attended his funeral in Harlem. The creation is from my volume, God's Trombones, read at Columbia University, December 24, 1935, James Weldon Johnson. And God stepped out on space. And he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. And far as the eye of God could see, darkness covered everything, blacker than a hundred midnights down on a cypress swamp. Then God smiled and the light broke. The darkness rolled up on one side and the light stood shining on the other. And God said, that's good. Then God reached out and took the light in his hands. And God rolled the light around in his hands until he made the sun 
and he set that sun ablazing in the heavens. And the light that was left from making the sun, God gathered it up in a shining ball and flung it against the darkness, spangling the night with moon and stars. Then down between the darkness and the light, he hurled the world. And God said, that's good. Then God himself stepped down. And the sun was on his right hand. The moon was on his left. The stars were clustered about his head, and the earth was under his feet. And God walked, and where he trod, his footsteps hollowed the valleys out and bulged the mountains up. Then he stopped and looked and saw that the earth was hot and barren. So God stepped over to the edge of the world, and he spat out the seven seas. He batted his eyes, and the lightnings flashed. He clapped his hands, and the thunders rolled. And the waters above the earth came down. The cooling waters came down. Then the green grass sprouted, and the little red flowers blossomed. The pine tree pointed its finger to the sky, and the oak spread out its arms. And the lakes cuddled down in the hollows of the ground, and the rivers ran down to the sea. Then God smiled again, and the rainbow appeared and curled itself around his shoulder. Then God raised his arm and he waved his hand over the sea and over the land, and he said, bring forth, bring forth, and quicker than God could drop his hand, fishes and fowls and beasts and birds swam the rivers and the seas, roamed the forests and the woods, and split the air with their wings. And God said, that's good. Then God walked around, and God looked around on all that he had made. He looked at his sun, and he looked at his moon, and he looked at his little stars. He looked on his world with all its living things, and God said, I'm lonely still. Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think, by a deep, wide river he sat down. With his head in his hands, God thought and thought, till he thought, I'll make me a man. Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay, and by the bank of the river he kneeled him down. And there the great God Almighty, who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand, this great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, kneeled down in the dust, coiling over a lump of clay, till he shaped it in his own image. Then into it he breathed the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Amen. Amen. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, uh, used dialect because he had to. He often uh, really uh, was saddened by the fact that to reach a white audience uh, at the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century, he had to resort to dialect, which was what the public had an appetite for. But that didn't stop Paul Lawrence Dunbar from re reflecting on uh, the, uh, the love he had for his people and their uh, upward mobility. Likewise, James Weldon Johnson wanted to use in God's trombones uh, the power of the African-American minister in telling stories and creating the drama and empathy that's necessary to bring people in. So with that, I'd like to welcome our poets uh, to uh, our stage. We have poet and poetesses, if I'm saying that right, uh, here, and we're excited to have them join us to actually offer uh, their readings of some of the poetry included in the, the, Book, of American, uh, Af America, the Book of American Negro Poetry. Uh, so with that, I'd like to bring our poets to the stage. Thank you. And would you, uh, we'll start with our elder. Let's have people who don't know who you are, find out. My name is Isid. I've been writing poetry 
for 50 years, and I've written 45 books, and about 75 plays. Mm. And I enjoy it because it helps me to know who I am, and it helps others to know who they are also. Uh, I enjoy it. I, I do workshops in schools, churches. I collect shoes and clothing from churches and schools. They don't pay me. They give me shoes or they give me clothes and I send them to Africa. Or I will send them to uh, Haiti. That's the place where I send them to now. I believe in helping people. I'm from a family of 10 children, eight, seven boys and three girls. And every morning, and I went to, to elementary school in Atlanta, Georgia. We always sang the Black National Anthem first. Then we sang the American National Anthem. And then we sang the World National Anthem. But we always knew something about ourselves first before we learned anything about anybody. We learned who we were. And that's what I try to do now, especially with children. Because a lot of children don't know who they are. They don't know their history. So we have to take the time to let them know what their history is so they can pass it on to the next generation. Uh, I'm going to be, begin now with a little poem called uh, It's the 21st Century and Our Dues Are Paid. Seems like we never tired. Our task ain't complete. Sights just to be seen through clear eyes without drugs or alcohol. You can tell your mama, you can tell your daddy, but you can tell your folks it's the 21st century and our dues are paid. Going into another world, a world of many sounds, black folks, kin folks sounds, and we will never fade because it's the 21st century and our dues are paid. Children, 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 we will give you our strength. Walk into our path. It's very direct and clear. Ain't got no time to be afraid because it's the 21st century and our dues are paid. This is our world too. Truth will guide us all the way. Strangers will sometimes trick you. Sometimes they will trick you into tricking who you are so you will have less knowledge of who you are. I, I have been writing poetry now since 1970. I've written uh, uh, 45 books of poetry, about 75 plays, and ha has produced and helped to produce 34 plays that include adult plays, children plays, and, and uh, 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 school plays. I've had, I've had plays that uh, uh, Linda McKinley, East Moore, East High School, South High School, um, uh, 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 the, the latest prison in, in Delaware, Ohio, or wherever people wants to see some of my works. I have written a, a, a movie called Equal Chances, and uh, I enjoy writing because it helps me to know who I am. It helps me to live with myself. I don't have down moments. All my moments are up, <laughs> positive. My, 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 my thing is up. I always try to do things that's gonna lift me or lift someone else up. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. The rose among the thorns. Well, that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Asset. Um, my name is Dion Custer Edwards, and um, I 
I'm a great many things um, and I identify in a great many ways. Um, but the making I do in the world is often with language, sometimes with sound, sometimes with music. I also am an educator and have spent the better part of my career in spaces where we learn and teach. I tend to work a lot with adolescents, so in high schools, but I also work with the littles too because they're sweet and bright and open and, um, and lovely to work with. Um, I am at the Wexner Center for the Arts in learning and public practice. And I head that area. And our endeavors are often education and community-based work. Um, I'm originally from Cleveland and grew up with a very rich art education. I think that's how I ended up in, in art education spaces because I went to public school and I went to Cleveland Heights all throughout my childhood. Grew up, graduated from Cleveland Heights, University Heights High School, go Tigers. And um, just had a really profound, I would say, art education. It was available to me. When there was so little available to me, that was available to me. And I, I think I wouldn't be the person that I am without a free art education that was available to me. Um, I did, once I showed interest in the arts, um, my mother, who's a way maker, um, convinced my father to get me involved in all these things. I wanted to do all the things in the arts. And so I got a chance to study at the museum. If anyone knows Cleveland Arts, there's just a really rich, long history. And I studied at the, the music settlement. I studied at the Cleveland Institute of Music for the better part of my childhood on up until I graduated high school. I got to study piano and flute and music theory and voice. Um, I began writing when I was in elementary school and fell in love with language and knew that that would be a part of my life forever. Um, came here to go to school, actually. Came to Ohio State and um, Studied a lot of things before I got brave enough to become an English major. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, I think I know what I'm supposed to major in. I love all my English classes. We talk, we write, I love it, it's the best. And she said, I was wondering when you were gonna discover that, when you were gonna discover that this is language and words was the place where you were supposed to be. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? She was like, because you wouldn't have done it if I would have told you. So she allowed me to discover it for myself um, and graduated from there, but also was involved. I was in a band in undergrad and got a chance to, to gig a lot and play. And so music definitely is a, is a kind of foundational or undercurrent in my work. I, I oftentimes am using my ear when I'm writing, um, music and rhythm show up. Um, so much, and, and um, Johnson talks about that. Johnson talks about how, how music shows up, and even sort of just hearing um, the poem that we just heard, the kind of, I grew up with those spirituals. I grew up with those, you know, so that feels very familiar. That's a familiar space. I grew up in the Baptist church, and, and so all of that runs through me, and got a chance to come here and, and live and work as an artist. There's, I continue to write. I continue to publish. I continue to work in education spaces. I've worked in dozens of schools across um, this city, and um, I created something called the Pages Program, and um, that's a, a dedicated program that is 17 years in the running, in, in the making, and, and a, a sort of dedicated space where we write all year long with high school students, and we spend time with them for a year. We bring in um, writers. I've worked with Scott and Pages, thank you, um, but lots of different writers and artists from all over this region and this area to work with students. And so I'm just really lucky to be able to have carved out a life where I can do that. And I'm happy to be here to, to speak about the topic today. Thank you for having me. It's amazing uh, you talk about the con connection between music and, and poetry. And uh, James Weldon Johnson also was an educator. That was his first career, a teacher. Uh, and of course, he did music with his brother. So was, 
is your band still active? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I to, you're going to get me in trouble. I tell people I'm retired as a musician, and the music tends to show up inside of me and sort of manifest, I think, in some other ways, particularly in my writing, I yes. think, in the way that I speak. I think the way that I move, uh -huh. the way that I move about the world, I think music sort of shows up there. Um, but I was, I was, I don't know, I was a lucky girl to get to study. I studied classical music for 20 plus years. I got a chance to study, if you all know, the great Hank Marr, the late great oh Hank goodness. Marr. You're, you're talking our language here. I got a chance to study with the late great Hank Marr because I went in and begged him to study, and I said, I would just love to learn. I, like, I've been learning jazz, but I really don't know what I'm doing, and I just really want to learn with you. And I just, he was like, why don't you play? And so I played, and he's like, okay. And I wasn't a music <laughs> major at the time, but um, he allowed me to study with him for two years and just, you know, really sort of teach me some foundational kinds of things around music, and particularly around jazz that I think changed me forever, particularly changed the way that I write, changed yeah. the way that I hear. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, for those of you who are, are watching and don't know, Hank Marr is a legend. He is the B3 patriarch. Organ. B3 pa organ. Yeah. Patriarch of, of the Hammond B3. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, and Columbus, Ohio, Central Ohio, is famous for its Hammond B3 players because of Hank Marr. Yeah. And, um, you know, it goes all the way now to Bobby Floyd and Linda Dactyl and other great Hammond B3 players who are still in this city. So right. thank you so much, Donna. And we have closest to me, Mr. Scott Woods. Scott. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> you um, <don't> <laughs> <laughs> so I want to begin by saying um, that whenever I'm in the presence of one of these two people, I always get a little flustered. Uh, when I began my work as a poet in the world, um, I actually saw both of these people at very formative stages in my life. Uh, I actually saw Dion first playing with the band uh, in the Hale Center, uh, the old Hale Center. So, um, so that was amazing. And then later, uh, I saw her performing with a group, uh, Hybrid Tongues. Um, yeah, right. And, uh, and I was like, I, I mean, I was already doing those things, but I was like, I, that's next level. And so as I was coming into poetry and into the open mic world and all of that, Dion was leaving. <laughs> and so I did not have the honor of, um, sharing stages and getting tutelage and, and being able to draw that energy. And so it's, it's always amazing to me to share that space and, um, and to see her in her, her light now. And then his said, of course, um, goes without saying, uh, when I began performing at open mics uh, regularly, his said was there because his said is always there. Um, his said is, I mean, He's the light, right? He's the, he's the, the path. And um, he was always, you know, pulling poets to the poets that he admired. He would pull them to the side and just, you know, drop a little knowledge on them, asking questions, you know, what you gonna do with this, you know, whatever. Does it pay? You know, whatever. <laughs> so, and, um, and there's just, I mean, there's, there are no, there are not enough words to, to, uh, speak to Isset's influence, uh, not just on me, but on, on Columbus poetry at large, right? He is not, uh, he is not the, um, he is not the godfather of black poets, right? He is the, he is the scion of all poets, right? And so, uh, so thank you both for putting me here, right? That's pretty much how that happened. Anyhow, I'm a poet, obviously, but I'm a writer of other things as well. Um, I have done a stint as a journalist for the last four years. Um, I've been running an open mic reading, the Writer's Block Poetry Night, for the last 24 years. Um, I run a nonprofit organization called Streetlight Guild, 
which is a performing arts organization uh, that has a venue right on Main Street. Um, and we do uh, a focus on Columbus artists with an emphasis on black artists, not exclusively, but largely. And so we're doing all manner of programming there, music, uh, art exhibits, readings, all of that. Um, and I've published a few books, um, like a drop in the bucket next to his head, but, uh, but they exist in the world, right? Uh, so that's the resume. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just add, as far as James Walton Johnson goes, just briefly, because I know we'll get a little deeper into it. Um, you know, to me, if you're, a, if you're a black poet, you have to be, I guess what we're calling Renaissance, but um, that's probably an insufficient term for Johnson. Um, you have to be so many things in this world, right? Um, the poetry alone will not save you. So you have to, you need your people, you need your work, you need their work, you need all of those things connecting. And so Johnson is an is a extremely powerful example of that in action. And I'll just stop there because I know Jack wants to get into it. Well, thanks, thanks, God. And, you know, I'd like to open this up to, you know, is said uh, to Deanna and to you, Scott. James Weldon Johnson's main thesis and, and part of what he really challenged all the Harlem Renaissance poets to do uh, was to uplift people via you know, poetry. Do you think the spoken word can actually have an impact? You know, the, 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 the poetic word can have an impact on how people perceive you, perceive your people, perceive the politics around them. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Izzet first because he talks about identity a lot. Uh, I would say so, yes. Uh, the way I got started as a performer, my father used to sing in a quartet. Mm -hmm. He sang nothing but notes, no lyrics. Mm -hmm. So once a month, he would go to Mississippi or South Carolina or Florida, and he would ask, anybody want to go? And I always raised my hand, because okay. I just could not believe that the whole world was like Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> yeah. So he, he would let me go, and then I got hooked on it. And then uh, uh, after a while, I started doing my own thing, and he started helping me out and helping me get where I was going. He never gave me any concrete advice, but he gave me some, some things that I needed to know because he was, he was a, a, a gospel quartet saying nothing but notes, no lyrics. Mm -hmm. I, I did lyrics, but no, no, <laughs> no gospel. <laughs> so we had a lot in common. Mm -hmm. And that's how I learned how to learn the business from, from watching him and his quartet. It was four of them. They was together for about 55 years. Wow. I can imagine, you know, a gospel quartet and a harmony, but, you know, think of someone like the Dixie and Hummingbirds or, you know, yeah. Pilgrim Travelers. Right, right. I, you know, just imagining that song, that, that song craft without words. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. That's spectacular. It was. It was. Did that sense of rhythm that you heard in the music uh, infuse the way you wrote poetry? Uh, not necessarily, uh -huh. because once I finished high school here in Columbus, I joined the service. And when mm -hmm. I was in the service, I had an opportunity to travel the world. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to know what the whole world was like. I didn't want to know what Atlanta was like or mm -hmm. Columbus. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know what the whole world was like. I, I just could not believe that the whole world was like America. So I had the opportunity to go to Japan, Okinawa, Korea, Formosa, Bangkok, the Philippines, France, Germany, Belgium, North Africa. And, and by, by doing that, I learned how other people live. Hmm. And it helps you to get, have respect for other people. Respect and perspective. Yes, Thank you, sir. Yes, indeed. Dion, <laughs> the, you know, the, the power of poetry to uh, ennoble and uplift, yes. you know, unoppressed people. Yes. Literature writ large in some cases. Yeah, you know, I do think 
there's something about language art I'll say it widely about art mm -hmm. but I'm definitely thinking of mm -hmm. the literary tradition I think there's something about making with language mm -hmm. that allows us to see hard things hear hard things shape hard things um, and really um, craft lines that even as they are hard they are beautiful mm. or hard to not read yeah. or hard to not turn away from. And that's what I think is really powerful about poetry yeah. Yeah. Um, is that the crafting of a line takes so much effort yes. and, and there's some patience. Sometimes you can be working on things for years, one piece for years or a body of work for years. And um, there is a kind of experience that you have to have in the world to, to sort of show up in, in the language. I think what, what Johnson was doing with this work here, mm -hmm. and I think what, what poetry can do, does do, will do, is show us things about our humanity. Mm -hmm. I think art does that. Art does that in a way that um, I think can be unexpected and surprising, can sometimes be deeply painful, but the art, when art does it, it's like, this might hurt a little, this might sting, or this <laughs> might open up some emotional space for you, but I'm not gonna leave you here with it. I'm here with you. And so the artist asks for that kind of exchange with the reader, for instance, and says, I'm here with you, actually. And, um, and in some ways, as I was reading through this text again and again, I was thinking about the lessons elders have taught me. Mm -hmm. I also remember it said, pull, we'll pull you aside. I mean, I was at the Hale Center too, right? <laughs> and just being with this, it said, and just being young and thinking, you know, you don't know anything, right? I still don't know. But like being young and thinking you know some things, thinking you're writing something. And said, so what, what? Okay, come, let's talk about that a little, you know? But then also very encouraging. And in some ways, the elders, I mean, they just continue to raise us. And in some ways, of reading these works, um, and I'll say something about um, it being heavily male, but we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, yes. <laughs> but um, sort of reading these works and hearing my fathers. Uh. And when I say my fathers, I say my grandfathers and my uncles and my father, and in all the, the, those, those sort of men or male perspectives in my life, and yeah. how, um, you know, some of, the, some of who I am, how they raised me. Um, but then also some things that um, were not, that were also hard. So really looking at how the mothers in my life and the fathers in my life had a life of their own that didn't have anything to do with me. They had their own lives. And that sometimes, oftentimes, shows up in my work. I write about how folks came up from Georgia, from Alabama, yeah. and moved to Cleveland. I think about how maybe my parents made art even more available to me to smooth out my blue collar edges and to do a little something else with this girl from Cleveland. Maybe you'll do a little something, right? So I do think art can. Um, can show us things that are hard to look at or to see or to feel um, and give us enough space to feel it and to honor it, yeah. remind us that we're human. I am glad this is being recorded because I really like what you just said and I didn't, I didn't have a chance to write it down. Very <laughs> profound, great analysis, Deanna. And you, know, you think about you know, your, your point that art, particularly poetry, allows you to address something that's hard or, or ugly, and, but you don't, leave the person there, you, you bring them to a resolution, mm -hmm. or at least hope. Yeah. I, I was just thinking of some of the poetry in, in recent years, uh, you know, of course, we've had, you know, powerful African American women, you know, offer poetry at inaugurals, you know, mm -hmm. uh, goodness mm -hmm. gracious, you know, Amanda Gordman, mm -hmm. and, and what she had to say, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, Maya Angelou, and all mm -hmm. the things she had to say, mm -hmm. uh, through poetry, things that probably would have started, you know, some type of, you know, social mm -hmm. media firestorm had they been spoken on media, but mm -hmm. speaking and standing in front of a microphone and doing it with poetry uh, really allowed people to look at some things they would rather not look at or would look away from. 
So thank you for that. Scott. I assume the question was rhetorical. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> I mean, the fact that we are talking about poets yeah. and painters and writers and dancers and more, a hundred years, at, more than a hundred years after the fact. Yeah. When we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, that's what we're doing. Um, it, it seems very, I mean, it's, it's easy to do, right? You just drop the Harlem Renaissance anytime you want to talk about black people in America. <laughs> but, you know, these, while, they, while the people of the Renaissance were many things, we recognize them primarily as artists of one type or another. Yeah. And so clearly that work does work mm -hmm. as something. Right? as activism, as nation building, as historical record. Um, as, you, know, you could run that list, I could run that list all day. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who does work uh, in the artistic community, as a you know, art curator, as, um, you know, as an essayist, mm -hmm. as a journalist, as a person who hires musicians, who hires artists for projects and various things, I am always cognizant of the example uh, of the Harlem Renaissance. I put, I created a Harlem Renaissance show specifically to bring that work uh, into the present again to show its relevancy, right? It's, it's not just historical. If it's just historical, then it can't hurt you, yeah. right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to change you at all. You have the option as to whether or not you will allow it to change you. But if it continues to be relevant, then you, you cannot deny its past. Yes. Good point. And so it's, you know, this book, this session, these words, all of that works. It's working right now, you know? Thank you. Is that, would you, uh, do you have a no, another poem you could grace us with here? Yes, uh, I have a short one here, it's called it's about life and death. We born, we live, we die. Our bodies returns to dust, which makes the things grow. Along comes from water and makes mud. Hmm. So be careful what you step in. It could be my life. Mm. Wow. There is so much we could unpack here. We could, we, we could do like a series of <laughs> seminars. Uh, but I wanted to give some of the, the people in the audience here, I'm, I'm cognizant of time. I'm looking at Josh and Zach and, and Paige. How much? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, very good. But no, I, I wanted to uh, reflect on something that Deanne said, that women were not present. You know the way they are now, you know, in, in 1922 during the Harlem Renaissance. But they were pioneers. Yes. You know, you, you had Zora stirring it up. Mm -hmm. what, what historical women that you, do you look to in, in the realm of the arts that inspire you and, and, and give you, you know, uh, that kind of like, if they did it, I can do it and shame on me if I don't do it better. Thank you. Thank you for um, that question. Um, I, when I was reading through this particular publication um, and thinking how important it was and how it situated artists who are identifying as black or mm -hmm. identifying as, um, at the time, um, uh, many things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, words where we don't, in the contemporary, mm -hmm. maybe um, use, but as of African descent, the diaspora, black. Mm -hmm. um, I was really looking for folks that I could identify with and folks that I could um, sort of trace some sort of a thread in the way that I'm identifying, in the way that I'm showing up in the world. And I, I really began to um, spend some time with Ann Spencer's work, 
Yes. And Georgia Douglas Johnson. Georgia Douglas Johnson, yes. And I wanted to study at Oberlin Conservatory, too, <laughs> like Georgia Douglas Johnson. That was a dream of mine for a really long time. I didn't end up studying there, but for a really long time, that was a dream. And um, Georgia also studied at Cleveland College of Music. So um, there's this Ohio literary tradition, yes. too, that I, that I think is really important and um Folks should sort of really go look at who are the writers um, that are that are writing in and around Ohio that may have lived in Ohio. I mean, obviously um, Dunbar and Hughes, um, but then we have um, our you know just our contemporaries as well. You know, um, folks like Jacqueline Woodson, and mm -hmm. I mean, you know. I just, I think that um, Rita Dove. Oh, of course. Um, I think that I'm always looking for some sort of echo or, or um, where do I learn this from? How do I know this? Um, and so I, I began really sort of looking at Ann Spencer's work and looking at George, um, Georgia Douglas um, Johnson's work and saying, oh, yeah. This is where I got this from. Um, Would you care to read one of your favorites? I, I might read a line or two <laughs> because, you know, some of this work I found not, it's beyond this, this publication. There right. is a piece that I want to sort of point out a couple lines, but um, Georgia Douglas Johnson says, a woman with a burning flame, deep covered through the years with ashes. Ah, she mm. hid it deep and smothered it with tears. Sometimes a baleful light would rise from out the dusky bed, and then the woman hushed it quick to slumber on as dead. At last the weary war was done, the tapers were alight, and with a sigh of victory, she breathed a soft good night. So I think about how Johnson writes about um, I don't know, the heart of a woman and strength and, um, you know, in the world, uh, she said, your world is as big as you make it. I know for I used to abide in the narrowest nest in a corner, my wings pressing close to my side. But I sighted the distant horizon where the skyline encircled the sea and I throbbed with a burning desire to travel this immensity. I battered the cordons around me and cradled my wings on the breeze, then soared to the uttermost reaches with rapture, with power, with ease. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of a, um, it's that kind of a sort of a wishing, but also that kind of inner strength, inner life, inner light that I didn't, I didn't make that up. So mm. when I write in that tradition, or I write looking for the light, or I write when it's dark around me and I'm looking, looking, you know, looking for, for spaces to breathe, um, you know, drawn to writers that, um, that have come before me, that run through me, yes. um, and that have taught me and will continue to teach me. So I found myself looking through this work for for women and for voices that were um, that had experiences that were either similar to mine or remind me of the mothers and the sisters and the daughters that um, that insert that have encircled my life. So, thank you. Well yeah. said. Thank you, Scott. Any further comments to the audience on the artistic experience that? you know, we're, we're basically, you know, living in, like you said, it's all now. It, it, it can't be history. It all has to be present. Sure. Um, so to kind of, I don't want to keep harping on the Renaissance. No. But it's instructive here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, the question about, I'm going to kind of touch on the question you just asked Dion, actually, mm -hmm. in while we're doing this, you know, the absence, the seeming absence of women 
you know, being heralded in that movement, uh, it's real um, and it's sad. Um, and the deeper that you dig into that movement, the sadder it becomes when you realize that that movement began with the efforts of women, True. women editors, women writers, Ida B. Wells, women journalists, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where that movement comes from, and then for various reasons. And there are a couple of excellent books on this, recent books on this. Mm. Um, one of them is uh, The New Negro, not the old The New Negro, but one that came out a few years ago. It talks about um, Locke very specifically and in great detail and about how you know some infighting kind of made the Renaissance happen and made certain things like women not happen, right? Anyhow, uh, all of that is to say uh, that you know to me um, you know the the art still functions. It's art, right? It's art. It's always going to function. But what we do with it is really the more important question or issue. It may not be a question at all, actually. So for instance, um, British writer Jeanette Winterson talks about, in an essay called Art Objects, or Art Objects, depending on how you read it, <laughs> she talks about how when we encounter art, you look at a painting. And you say, I like this or I don't like this. That's about you. That is not about the art. That is all about you as the audience, the viewer, the reader, the listener, right? And so art should force you to interrogate not the art, but yourself, right? So when it talks about, mm -hmm. I write to you know, mm -hmm. learn who I am, you should write, learn who you are. Like that's why you should be surrounded by as much art in all its forms as possible. Mm -hmm. Not because it's great or because you like it, but because, it, because in, in responding to it, you are asking yourself questions. Or you should be, you should be, right? There's a whole arts festival happening a few miles away. That's a lot of questions sitting in the street, right? So, um, so you know, this work, you know, the collection that Johnson put together, um, and the work that he did, all of that um, is informative on several levels, or it should be informative on several levels. Do I like it? Sure, that's fine. But what's behind this? What's behind me liking or not liking it? And what is behind him deciding what should be in it? You know, what are the circumstances in that? Because the thing that, that you mentioned at the top of this entire event about this mission for, you know, many of these artists, not exclusively or entirely or absolutely, I should say absolutely these artists, but most of these artists, you know, to create work that shows, you know, black people in a certain way so that they can change their lot in society, mm. right? Their lives is cool, I mean, you know, relatively speaking. They're trying to get everybody else to be cool, right? Mm. We're trying to get everybody else to behave a certain way, act a certain way, legislate a certain mm. way spend money a certain way, live a certain way, politic a certain way. That's what this work is doing. That's what it's about. And that's, that's still what black art is about. Sad to say, right? Sad to say. Like we should be 50 years at least past that particular agenda, but we're not which is fascinating considering how many people, you know, are rich or are, you know, how many black arts are rich or have access to things. You know, there's, there's some learning that has to happen in both ways on that street. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a few moments. Uh, we could entertain a question or two from the audience. I think we have, what, about five minutes left, Josh? <laughs> 
Any questions from the audience? It's 90% luck. <laughs> and then the other 10% is intent. Um, now, that's on one level, right? That is how is art that is 100 years old, how does that make it into being in front of me 100 years later? That's 10%. Well, actually, that's all of that, but largely the 10%. But there's 100 times more of this art that's just the 90%, right? Or maybe, maybe. It just functions as art, right? Like it just... Art persists because it is art. It is not a choice, right? No society chooses to be artistic. It is. They all are. Even when that art is merely functional, it is still art. They perceive the value of it as a thing that must exist for something to function, right? And so a vase is not just a vase, right? It's not just a jug. <laughs> It is an artistic jug, it is a cultural jug, it is a historical record, it is a story, which is so many other things on top of that. And so art does that whether we acknowledge it or not, right? A cave painting that we have not discovered yet <laughs> is still a cave painting. It is still in some function art. So if the question is how do we make art persevere beyond social, you know, means and taste, flavor, that's that 10%, that's that intent. We have to want that. Yeah. We as a society, as a community, as a city, as a family, as a couple of people sitting on the set, well, like, we have to want that to happen, to make, and we can make that happen. It's never been easier. It's never been easier. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, if I may add a few thoughts to how you summed it up in such a way that, I don't know, there's something you keep saying that's resonating with me about art doing a kind of work. Art is laboring. It's laboring. Whether we recognize it or not, whether we even feel it or not, it is laboring. This stage is laboring. This building is laboring. These words we have in our pockets are laboring. We are laboring. Now, some of us are laboring in a way that others are not. But art is laboring. And art has created a kind of infrastructure, a kind of cultural infrastructure, that I appreciate what you said about whether we acknowledge it or not. It is here. It is the history. It is our histories, our cultural history, histories. It is the evidence of our humanity. And so we can take that and say we like it or we don't like it. We can take that and collect it or not. But at the end of the day, it just is. And great societies and cultures allow that infrastructure to exist. Preserve it. Care for it. Support it. Resource it. Acknowledge it. You don't have to like all of it but understanding why art exists in a society and why artists are very important contributions to any great society, contributing in ways that you can look or not look, but still contributing in really important ways. And they didn't choose that. Art, you're either born doing that or you're not. You're either an artist or you're not. You go into a profession or you don't. But artists are doing a work that I think still is invisible. And artists who are identifying as black are definitely doing a work that it, it completely, right? It's still very invisible. You think you know some things and, you don't, and we don't, we don't. And so in some ways that endurance question is an interesting one because it's like, I would then say, because art has us in inquiry, I love that, yes. Um, how might we endure? Because we can ask the question whether or not art will endure. I'd like us to really think about that in the context of 
how might we endure? But we almost didn't get to know Hurston, yeah. right? She died poor, and eventually her work became obscure. And we only got her because Alice Walker got curious, right? It can, it's, you have to want it. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to uh, add to all this wonderful commentary something I, I in my studies, I, I read has, has resonated with me for over a decade. It's something that Lorraine Hansberry wrote. Mm -hmm. and, she, and she said, by concentrating on the authentic, the, the details of your life, which is what his said does, and I think that's why he's such a genius poet, by concentrating on that particular, that specific part of your humanity, if you do it honestly and authentically, you discover something that's universal. And that universal is what lasts. We'll let you have the last words, Mr. Said. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Some years ago, I read uh, Ossie Davis. And I started sending him some of my books. Oh, Ossie. And he would critique them, and he would write them back and let me know what he thought of them. But he said, uh, I like your work, but you're hitting them too hard. Ah, you're hitting them too hard. <laughs> so he said, he say, what you need to do is hit them hard and make them laugh. Mm -hmm. there you go. And I found out that works. So very true. Well, <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Doug Kreitler and the Bexley Public Library, the entire staff, Josh, Zach, uh, Paige. Thank you for this. I, I think this is something that we will be uh, not so much proud of, but happy and privileged to have participated on. You know, and the pride speaks to you. It, it, this is not about us. This is about sharing uh, with our, our audience uh, these observations that we think will help us endure, Dion. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.